What makes a good conversation? My mother would say, Getting my point across. One of my grad students would say, Feeling listened to. My most touchy-feely friend would say, Preserving or improving a relationship. A sense that we got closer. I can't say for sure. I didn't ask any of them. <laughs> but I reckon that no one would include being a good listener. At best, they might frame the role of, of listening as something more active. I feel satisfied when I'm helpful, when I can comfort someone well. Enough speculation. After a bit of warm-up, I asked someone in a hotel lounge, what makes you feel satisfied in a conversation? The man had removed his shoes and was wearing thick wool socks. He said, reciprocity, genuine interest in whatever the other is saying. After a good conversation, you come away with some energy. And I almost asked, do you play squash? <laughs> <laughs> Sometime later, while zoned out in a meeting, my thoughts naturally turned to another form of the question. What makes a good meeting? In a structured environment, a good meeting feels like multiple viewpoints are presented, <clears throat> weighed, selected, and there's a consensus on future action. Time clips along. As for a bad meeting, that's easy. It's stagnant, dominated by a few voices, recycles the same point. It's stagnant, dominated by the same voices, <laughs> regurgitates a similar point. It's stagnant. <laughs> a good conversation takes time. If it's really good, it dilates time. When it is restricted to a short, fixed duration, the speakers become intent on making their points before the gong sounds. They listen strategically for points of disagreement and wait for moments to interject reiterations of their position. Speakers report more than engage. They never lay down the burden of their intention to receive the gift of another person's words. The conversation feels cinched in an alley between two buildings that ends at a brick wall. But a good conversation opens toward a horizon. This kind of undefined time has been eroded to the point that we find it uncomfortable. We can blame the doctrine of productivity, which is not new. The devil for a long time has been finding work for idle hands to do. The value of keeping busy is only wearing a new word, productivity, doubtlessly linked to the word product, which itself points to capital. The other culprit behind the erosion of conversational time is, paradoxically, distraction. We are actively distracted by pings, reels, data, listicles, flavors of chips. Conversations require transcendental leisure, like Thoreau sauntering around for four hours every day, in the same way that quality work requires sustained periods of concentration rather than multitasking. Philosopher Byung Chul Han makes a good point about multitasking. It is not an advanced quality. He writes, Multitasking does not represent civilizational progress. It is commonplace among wild animals. It is an attentive technique indispensable for survival in the wilderness. An animal busy with eating must also attend to other tasks. For example, it must hold rivals away from its prey. It must constantly be on the lookout, lest it be eaten while eating. Productivity and distraction are twin evils. A good conversation is built on curiosity and attention. This means lending all of our senses to people. Here's a little plug. If you want to improve these two capacities, read poetry. Every detail matters. <laughs> Every switchback at the end of a line resensitizes your attention. The language and world of poetry is strange enough to make you ask questions. The question is the clearest sign of curiosity. It promotes spontaneity and originality. I bristle at superficial rote questions, although I long for people to be genuinely curious about me. We need the social forms of politeness. How are you? Fine to get us through the ice, to keep us together long enough for our defenses to break down. But a good conversation moves beyond rote questions and responses. 
Ian, a good conversation is also a tennis match. Hmm. You're challenging the other to bring their best game. Nothing worse than having the other agree with you. Agreed. <laughs> Charles Duhigg, author of Super Communicators, suggests ways of reframing simple questions into deep ones, thereby opening up a conversation for more than factual answers and increasing the chances of connection. Are you married becomes, tell me about your family. Where did you go to high school becomes, what advice would you give a high schooler? And you can simply add, what's the best to ordinary questions to zhuzh them up? Where do you live? What's the best thing about your neighborhood? Where did you go to college? What's the best part of college? And the problematic? Where are you from? What's the best thing about where you grew up? Now that last one feels strategic and deceptive. Curiosity is necessary if you are to connect with others. Perhaps you've met the kind of man who speaks only in declarative sentences, no questions. He possesses a certainty that masquerades as confidence, but is really underdeveloped curiosity. I wish it were fatigued curiosity, but it's not. This man's incurious nature is symptomatic of brutishness and brutality. So curiosity is the first point uh, for a good conversation. Attention is the other. There's a limit to our attention, no? How long does it take for people to stop caring? If a politician or government engaged in a war knew that the media news cycle for an acute event is on average four days, and for a war, 90 days, then they could just wait us out. A conversation can occur on multiple levels. A science conversation in the penthouse unfolds beautifully through a fusion of passion, discovery, and significance. Even scientists use the word elegant for those moments. And this type of conversation has the uncanny ability to be both erudite and accessible. A few levels below the penthouse, in large suites owned by academics, a scientific conversation is pitched at the level of statistical significance, studies, journals. A conversation in the lobby, where there's the most traffic, tends to be general, muddled, with various degrees of commitment. Much public conversation occurs in the lobby, and increasingly, in the basement, which is pretty much a fight club. I would say that most conversation pitched to folks in the lobby feature embarrassingly reductive discourse. Complex situations and ideas are reduced to slogans, headlines, sound bites of an entire press conference, pro-life, pro-choice, survival of the fittest. We are in an age of conversation as slogan, as a series of talking points, regurgitations. We rarely have sustained complex public conversations outside of our work or areas of knowledge. When the press, say, engages with the public, it's as if with a child who has strong emotional tendencies and an undisciplined will and can only ingest a brightly colored, heavily processed, easily digestible snack. Consequently, we are raised on a diet of snacks without desire or ability to process complex carbohydrates. Without a doubt, simple conversations are necessary sometimes. Entry into a field needs a ramp, and new people are always entering these conversations. But just as we, the public, were able to process with increasing sophistication how mRNA vaccines worked, in relation to traditional vaccines, that is, we rose to meet the challenge of the pandemic, so too we can rise to increase our literacy, learn to ask better questions, to seek clarification until we get to the point of reasonable complexity. Knowing how much and which details to provide is the trickiest part of having a conversation on multiple levels.
too many details and you lose a non-specialized audience? Too few and you insult them by dumbing down the conversation. We are oversaturated with words and attempts to communicate with us. Hence all the ads, friendly packets of information claiming to know what we want, to promise us pleasure, ask your doctor if this is right for you. These are not conversations in any true sense. Our data is mined stealthily, and then we're spoken to in terms of what we buy or search for, out of the abundance of one's heart, right? Or in terms of a powerful cultural understanding of status, beauty, uniqueness, independence, or whatever. Yet these attempts fail so often because they neglect an elusive and resistant part of ourselves, the part of the human that is not for sale, something like the will. And they fail because they cannot time our desires with their fulfillment. They miss us at the right moments. And they fail because they do not interact with us. The only responses they ask of us are consumption, agreement, and amusement. The range of interactions possible with an object will always be limited, even as objects get closer and closer in intelligence to simulating humans. We don't interact with our objects except in circumscribed ways. There's a use for a shirt. And similarly, these messages as objects also limit the ways we interact with them. They do not require creative or deep engagement. They are built on the flattened pictures we post of our past rather than the experiences themselves. And so they get the flattened, superficial parts of us. We know that the ads and the people behind them do not want to engage with us as anything more than consumers. They do not care about us. A good conversation has care as a precondition. And there's so much of it, so much messaging, so many words all the time launched at us. The endless scroll, the news digests, the warm voices in the YouTube ads telling us to take vacations, the influencers, our friends talking at their screen as we look at their 2D incarnation. The 10 hottest new restaurants in Toronto right now. Election 2024, everything you need to know in maps and charts. Climate change, world way off target to limit warning, says UN. And with all of this noise, it is easy to delude ourselves into thinking that we are participating in culture, that we are socializing, that we are up to date with the zeitgeist. It's no longer enough to know what the number one pop song is. We have to keep up with the latest words and the shifting categories of being, the increased permissiveness, the renamed streets. We are being told things and we're swallowing as fast as we can without chewing or digesting. The people we admire say, This was acceptable. It is no longer acceptable. Accept it. There's a lot of pressure on us to be the best version of ourselves. We are to tend our bodies into perfect specimens down to our eyebrows. We are to tend our inner lives, becoming more woke and more mindful, setting boundaries, avoiding toxic people. Sometimes I feel that what we really need is not self-actualization, but escape. Conversation allows us to escape the pressures and burdens of being on of moving toward decisions and plans of action. It asks us to pay sustained attention and attend to new perspectives until we forget ourselves. It offers us a kind of transcendence that exposes materialism, the paying for products that are quickly compacted in the landfill of our hearts to make room for more. I confess that I have countless worries about the future of conversation. Here are a handful. First, we will become so polarized that conversations with strangers will be thought of as antagonistic encounters of worldviews all the time. We find ourselves braced, locked into a defensive mode, unwilling to budge from the things we believe in, holding flags and banners, distributing buttons. The lines of this polarization will be political, 
and religious. Politics organizes a lot of the details of practical life, aligns us with a tradition of thought, and gives us group membership, which can pass as community. As with politics, from religion we get prepackaged core beliefs, deference to past ideas, imbued authority from those ideas, the same kind of allegiances to groups. Religion is like the pure mathematics of politics, which itself would be like applied math. And by religion, I don't just mean whether someone is Muslim or Christian or Jewish. Secular values, the quiet religion of the last century and a half, with ardent and casual adherents alike, also constitute a religion, an atheism, a belief system. I mean any system that attempts to answer how we got here and what we're doing here. Ideologies dominate our ability to dissent from institutions because they simply don't value anything but total adherence. I fear we won't respect the rights of others to dissent from our religious or political systems. But it's too late to talk about that. That's a book in itself. My second worry about the future of conversations concerns the place of technology in determining how we relate to each other. Will innovation progress to a point where people 25 years from now speak 50% less than people today? Well, that would make a great speculative novel. You could have characters who are evolutionarily different with throats that were once for speaking, but are now just for eating. We're getting silly, but tech changes how we interact. It obfuscates the humanity of the person we're talking to. The body introduces various considerations and tensions within our communication, such as, that guy could pummel me. But the online self evades all of that. Tech disembodies us, for now. My third concern is again about technology, but less of a worry and more of a point to monitor. Technology is making changes at the atomic level of language. We communicate visually with emojis, we condense phrases to acronyms, blah, blah, you've heard this. I'm not too worried. English is shifting in really exciting ways with new words and arrangements. The energy comes from waves of young people who have a linguistic renaissance in their teen years. The internet makes these changes rapid, powerful, ubiquitous. Fourth fear. I worry that increasing isolation means that we will have fewer trusted companions to talk to. Our conversations with AI will evolve conversations into stilted, one-sided, transactional intercourse. We may come to expect of our human partners the same level of efficiency and service. Yes, service during a conversation. And because AI is disembodied, we will have a permanent severance of conversation from social context. To engage with AI is not a social act, not yet, at least. Eventually, it may merge with social media to give us the illusion of participation in social life. I worry that we'll have fewer deep conversations over a lifetime. That means that our chances to have mirrors of ourselves to take on the perspectives of others, to ask good questions, to be taken seriously, to make others laugh, to be recognized as multifaceted beyond functional conversations. All of these things are threatened. Ian, you really should have ended before this doom and gloom <laughs> on the interconnectivity of all things. Human conversation reminds us that the universe is in conversation with itself. And a great conversation puts us in tune with the universe. Too late, Edna. Fifth fear. About the more immediate future, I'm afraid of returning to silence once we part.
we do live in, in a very fraught moment, a mm. uh, very divisive, a very violent moment. And words, too, can be used as weapons by those who would other people, by those who would dehumanize them. Yeah. And I wonder what your thoughts are about whether it's even possible to reset a conversation when it's gone off, when it's gone over a cliff already. Yeah. Like, if we can go back in time to like 2015 or so, right? <laughs> pre-pandemic, pre-sort of the US election, and then have a second go at this. I mean, that would be, that would be ideal. But I'm not sort of like a believer in moving forward by pretending that things didn't happen. I think we had a really sort of rough seven, eight, ten years. And to recognize that our cultures and our democracies are so frail that they can be disrupted really quickly and transformed really quickly and say, uh-oh, um, what went wrong there? How could we avoid this happening again? Um, I think there needs to be kind of like reclaiming of logical discourse of a couple of things, of logical discourse and not just emotional rhetoric, right? Um, that's one thing. So that we're not always just kind of responding to, this is my team and I must stick with my team and I feel loyalty um, to this group. So um, when you go online, you'll find a lot of people saying things about like having the moral courage to support this position or that position. And I think the thing that requires the most moral courage is to change your own mind about a belief that you've treasured for a long time. To say, um, I've thought about this group of people this way for the last 40 years or something, and I've got all the reasons, and I've got all the ammunitions, and it's comfortable, but maybe I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And to say that to someone, to say like, hey, here's an opening in my ideology where I think I might have gotten this wrong, or I'm growing and evolving, that for me requires moral courage. It's quite cowardly to stay in a fixed, entrenched position without that refining itself over time. I'm getting like emotional talking about it. Yeah. You can clap, absolutely, please. <clears throat> yeah. In the absence of a, an immediate question, I'll, I'll ask you a follow-up. Speaking mm. of courage, you also talk about something in your book uh, about the courage of silence. Mm. Can you explain what you meant by that? So sometimes, you know, it's cowardly to sort of hold your peace, right? You don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get canceled. You don't want to say the wrong thing. There's a kind of cowardly silence too. Um, but the silence that I'm talking about is that early silence um, as you're coming to form your opinion that you can take a moment and say, no, I don't have it all worked out yet. Yes, I'm still weighing the evidence on this side and that side. Um, no, I'm not gonna commit to your, you know, your cause or whatever right now because I haven't worked it out. And that space of indecision, that space of silence is really infuriating to people. And we need the activists, right? Like we need them to keep things moving, right? And to agitate. They kind of come to things before the rest of us do. Um, but in that space of silence, you have really thoughtful people weighing evidence and coming with more complex positions later on in all of this. So, like, don't feel guilty about your silence. Eventually, some kind of position will emerge, and that position will get reformed and shaped and refined. Um, but silence is not something that we should feel um, ashamed of. And you know what I mean, okay? I don't have to, like, split hairs and say and qualify. There's the cowardly kind, but that's not the kind that I'm talking about. Uh, what's the best thing about your favorite flavor of chips? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to start a conversation, please. Oh my gosh. You know what, I'm like, I'm, I'm in my mid forties right now and I've gone right back to nature for chips and vanilla for ice cream. You know, <laughs> all the fancy stuff of like youth just strip away, so. That's, That's it, great. plainness. Wonderful. Yeah. What do you do, uh, how do you personally navigate when curiosity and engagement in a conversation goes incredibly wrong? Uh, when you ask the wrong question, when you are prying, maybe you're too forward, because I think curiosity is maybe not just a personality trait, but a relationship between two people. Right. 
So assuming this is not with a stranger, right? Assuming this person knows you, right? Um, I think we have to give people um, credit for their intelligence and their sympathy. If somebody knows you, if somebody knows me, they know I can be quite curt or quite direct or quite short, and they know that's just kind of the way he is. I can develop that capacity. I can become, you know, um, warmer and like just hugging people left, right, and center. Um, but the people we're talking to, I don't think they're quite beating themselves up the same way that we are, right? They're like, I understand my son. <laughs> I know this is what he's like, um, and he will come around. But it behooves us after that point not to sort of um, exhaust their goodness with us, right? Exhaust their mercy with us. If we know there's some kind of deficit there, we fix it. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm answering that strangely to you. I'm saying trust that the person knows that you have the best intentions in mind instead of springing to get defensive um, and then uh, escalating things up, yeah? yeah. Thank you for the great questions. And Ian, what a privilege to listen and learn with you. And thank you for getting us talking. Oh, thank you, Nala. Thank you so much. Yeah, Ian Williams, everybody. Congratulations. <laughs>